Thank you, John. How's everybody doing? Good. Good. All right. Um, well, a question for the young people in the audience. Raise your hand if you actually really feel like you know what you're going to be doing in your life. <laughs> OK. All right. Um, so when I was your age, I had um, absolutely no idea. I was sort of ignorant but well-meaning. And I, life, to me, felt kind of like a tapas platter, just sampling all these different dishes. And um, I got into the clean energy sector uh, about 14 years ago. And it was the best decision of my life. And so I have an assignment for all of you, which is to take on climate change. This is the challenge of our generation. And it's actually something we can do a lot about. And so I think um, this is the <coughs> opportunity for everybody here to find a way to do that. I'm going to walk through uh, a little bit about my story and the, what's happening in California. And um, then we can just have a, have a discussion about uh, some of the opportunities ahead. Um, let me just begin. Uh, the Energy Commission is uh, sort of the leading agency in California on energy. We basically do a fruit cup of different activities. We have about a $100 million we give away every year on clean transportation, electric vehicle charging infrastructure, et cetera. About $140 million a year on research and development. We run a program for new solar homes. Uh, we have very strict efficiency standards for buildings and appliances, et cetera. And I started there in, in February of this year. Um, so you don't have to be a big state to make a big difference. I was actually really excited to come to Vermont because you guys have actually been leaders. Uh, and I, I look at what this state has done, and it's personally inspiring to me. I think, you know, when you think about gay marriage, which is now, I think, legal and just about to be legal, I think, in Hawaii next week, uh, 16 states, you know, that was really begun here in Vermont with the civil unions bill. When you think about the local food movement and, and so many environmental policies, really Vermont has played a critical role. And I think you guys should be excited about imagining the possibilities of what you, can, what you can be as a state, as a template for good policy. And you don't have to be, be a big state <coughs> to make a big difference. I think that's really important to remember because policies move laterally between states quite quickly and quite effectively. And actually, the moment we're in politically right now, very little meaningful is getting done in Washington, D.C. The action is really <coughs> at the state level. <laughs> and that's can you guys hear okay? And that is particularly true, uh, particularly true on, on energy. So. Um, I worked in South Africa uh, in 1997 for Nelson Mandela's youth program. My dad is a journalist, and he took me there um, actually in 1994, uh, right before the elections were happening. So it was just the very end of apartheid. I fell in love with the country, and I was looking for a way to go back. And so I went back in 1997. Mandela had a youth empowerment program, so I was in the Eastern Cape. And one of the first things that the ANC government did when they took power is they set up mail service in the townships, OK? A lot of these areas had had no mail service. And these were all done with actually solar-powered uh, mail stations. And for the first time, there was access to, to mail. And um, that was when I actually first kind of saw the potential connection between a renewable resource like solar and actually the democratization of a country. Because you can't, so it's distributed, right? And so you can really put it anywhere. Uh, and actually, in the developing world, solar, you really, it's like, kind of like a cell phone leapfrogging landlines. In many of these places, they're putting solar before there is any other electricity source there. So um, that was when I first kind of got excited about solar. I went on to, to graduate school. And when I was in graduate school, uh, Al Gore came to talk. And he gave the speech that later turned in the movie Inconvenient Truth. And by the end of that talk, I was absolutely persuaded that climate change is the number one threat facing the world, and that this was what I wanted to work on. And these things continue to be confirmed. So this year in California is turning out to be the driest year ever on record. Okay, And we had this typhoon this week in the Philippines that killed 10,000 people. I mean, we are, it's already happening. And I think it's easy sometimes to get um, discouraged or disempowered, just feel like you can't do it's so big. But I actually think the reality is that while climate change is already underway, there's gradations of what it could look like. And it could actually become much, <coughs> much worse, or it could stabilize. Uh, and that depends on what we do. And I think that's what we need to always remember. Keep going. Um, so I went on from there to work for Willie Brown, who uh, was mayor of San Francisco. Really funny story about Willie Brown. He is the only mayor in uh, a big city in the United States that I, I'm aware of that uh, keeps his phone number listed in the white pages. 
And so people would call him at home to complain about stuff. This woman calls him at like three in the morning, one morning to complain that her street light was out and she wanted it fixed. So he wakes up, writes down the information, and the next day he gets it fixed. Then he sets his alarm for three in the morning the next night and calls her back and says it's fixed. <laughs> <laughs> so he, so he was great to work with. Um, we put together uh, with a coalition there a proposal. This is right during the blackouts in California in 2001. Um, we literally had rolling blackouts in, in the city of San Francisco, and it was a kind of a good opportunity to seize um, to try and do something big on renewables. So we put together a package, a $100 million proposal. I was in the shower one day, and I'd been working on this $100 million parks fund, which we just passed. And you know, anytime you have a victory, it kind of gets you thinking about what else we can do. And so we thought, okay, let's do this. And so we uh, put this package together to do efficiency and solar for public buildings. And we decided. We wanted actually not to run it as legislation, but to do it as a ballot initiative to give people the opportunity personally to <coughs> vote uh, on this initiative and to do a big kick-ass campaign for it. So we had about 200 volunteers. This is in November of 2001. We got out, you know, campaigned on street corners. We did door knockers. We were in the subway stations. Sometimes it's hard in the rush of people getting on the subway to like get people to take your, you know, pamphlet or whatever. And we found one thing that worked for particularly for women over 40. If you say, ma'am, are you old enough to vote? They'd love that. They'd always take the, always take the hand out. And so um, we got our, our message out, and it passed by 73%. And, it, and we felt that was important to send a message. And then these are some of the projects that came about. The lower left there is um, the San Francisco International Airport. So we were there. On the lower right is our convention center, the Moscone Convention Center. That, at the time, it was installed at 675 kilowatts with the largest solar roof. In the country, that's now been surpassed by many other projects, happily. Uh, that is a, a reservoir, the Sunset Reservoir. And then um, this year, they're finally going to be around to do City Hall. That's San Francisco City Hall. So be solar on all those buildings. So I went on after that to start an organization called Vote Solar, which does solar policy advocacy in about 15 states around the country. Did that for four years. One of the states where my colleague, um, <coughs> My co-founder uh, was campaigning with New York, and this is actually at the time of the BP oil spill. And they were campaigning for a, a big uh, billion and a half dollar solar program, which got, got through New York. Um, and the ad, they, they rented an ad uh, outside of the state capital of New York and said, when, you, when there's a huge solar energy spill, it's called a nice day. So that was the, <laughs> the message there. So in California, what we're trying to do is really hard. We're trying to get to 33% renewables by 2020. And the governor also wants to do 12 gigawatts of clean distributed generation. So Vermont's load roughly is about, about one gigawatt, just for perspective. And someone told me in a meeting today that California annually adds basically one Vermont a year in terms of population. So, uh, <laughs> so um, this is really tough, but uh, we have overcome big challenges before. And just a little bit of history. In the early 1970s, uh, just before the Energy Commission was established, the state legislature in California commissioned the RAND Corporation to do a study. And the finding was on our energy future. And the finding was energy demand was growing at 8% a year. Okay, That's a very, very steep growth rate. And the only solution, they said, was to build 40 nuclear plants in California. So we have a 800 mile coastline in the state of California and uh, that would mean a nuclear plant every 20 miles along the California coast. And so the legislature said, no, we've got to go a different direction. Let's get serious about alternative energy. Let's get serious about efficiency. And so the Energy Commission was born out of that, um, out of that crisis. And actually I just had lunch with the now 86 year old state legislator uh, who wrote that bill, Charlie Warren, who also created the 911 system uh, and uh, the California Coastal Commission. Um, and is still pushing us, you know, go harder. So. Um, so in 1975, we did our first energy standards <laughs> for buildings and, and, and for appliances. Oh, let me just show you this. This is what California would look like with 40 nuclear plants. Today, we only have one, okay? So um, that is a success story. Um, this is, we did appliance standards starting in 1975. So this is energy use of a refrigerator, okay, prior to the standards. And basically the way the standards work is we set that standard 
And then industry cannot sell their product into our state unless it complies. And so because we have 40 million people, they pay attention to that. And very often those standards actually, effectively they'll, they'll make one product for the whole US. So California in some cases, <coughs> not all cases, but in some cases, the standard can effectively you know, change the product they make for the country. So in refrigerators, here's what happened. After the standards, okay, we basically cut it by 75%, <coughs> the energy use. And at the same time, this is the green line, is the cost of the refrigerator. They found out how to make it cheaper. So the cost basically gets cut you know, by 60% roughly. And the size of the refrigerator uh, more than doubles, or not quite doubles, from the same, so it's 18 cubic <coughs> feet to 22. So be basically a you know, 30% increase. So you end up with a refrigerator that uses 75% <coughs> less energy and is basically 60% cheaper and 30% bigger, okay? So standards, you'll often get pushback from the industry if just not possible. And, you know, at a certain point, I mean, you just have to look back. We've done this before. And actually, one of the projects I'd love to get a student to do this is to go back for every environmental policy that's equivalent and find out what the industry said, you know, that it wasn't possible. Because it's, you hear the same thing from utilities about the RPS. You hear the same thing. And, you know, at the end of the day, it is possible most of the time. So one example of the kind of energy savings we're doing, this is a standard that just went into effect in February. So if you have a device like a cell phone charger or a electric shaver and you plug that into the wall, when the device is fully charged, it will actually continue to draw power from the outlet. Why is that? There, there is a 25 cent shutoff diode that would prevent that, but the manufacturer of the device has no incentive to do that because they don't pay the energy bill. And the consumers, of course, have no visibility on this at all. Do you ever even think about that when you buy? I don't, you know, it's just, and this is actually precisely the role for smart policy. Because we, we basically said, okay, you can't sell your product in California until you put in this 25 cent diode. That one standard, which started in February, is saving now $300 million a year. And the nice thing about appliances, which is different, for example, from our standards with housing, new buildings is that appliances turn over relatively quickly, so you get actually the savings, uh, you know. I mean, how many people here bought a cell phone in the last two years? So, yeah, probably half of you, right? So it turns over fast. So you have, appliance standards actually are probably the least sexy, uh, most meaningful way to get uh, efficiency savings quickly, so. So, since the efficiency standards started in 1975, um, We've saved $140 billion for ratepayers over that 40-year period. Um, $65 billion in gas and $75 billion in electricity savings. And it's interesting, even now, there's actually kind of an attack um, on the standards by industries that are resisting. Uh, they don't like the idea of standards. They're very worried about it spreading. And so they're saying, well, that would have occurred, you know, anyway. And that's just not true. At the end of the day, I mean, the savings happen because there is a standard. And the proof is in the pudding. So this blue bar represents the average uh, energy load of the rest of the country. And California is red. So we're using half the energy uh, per capita. And I don't know what Vermont's is, but I imagine it's something close because I know you guys are, have been really, really strong on, on efficiency as well. So great uh, success story that's not, not widely known. And by the way, I mean, I will tell you, I think one of the observations I have is the success stories in energy don't get anywhere near the attention of the failures. So how many of you, for example, remember a company by the name of Solyndra? Uh, okay, so a number of you. So this is the solar company that got a half a billion dollar loan as part of the stimulus package to scale up. They went out of business um, and most of that loan was not repaid, okay? Um, that company represented two tenths of 1% of the whole solar industry and, and I was in the solar industry at the time. It became the most recognized solar company in the country, um, but the success stories, for example, like Tesla, uh, the electric car manufacturer, also got a half a billion dollar loan, which they repaid in its entirety nine years early. Like, how many people here knew that, for example? A couple, there you go, well that's <laughs> impressive. So mo that's more people in California. Uh, I mean, it's um, actually, uh, just my observation is the success stories don't get told that widely. So part of what we need to do is actually purely a better job on communications, because I think, uh, Part of the answer is actually telling those success stories better and helping replicate the policies that, that work. 
So we have a 33% RPS. We had a 20% RPS, and when Governor Brown was elected in, RPS yeah. Yeah, so that's the Renewable Portfolio Standard. And that um, basically says that by the year 2020, 33% of all the electricity <laughs> has to come from renewable energy. And if you, you're a utility and you're not in compliance with that, you get fined. So we had a 20% RPS. And the first thing Governor Brown did when he, when he was reelected, or was he, he was elected for the first time in 2010, was he raised that to 33%. So in California, it's a little bit different in different states, but where we draw the boundary is we exclude large hyd hydro. So hydro that's 30 megawatts or smaller can qualify, solar qualifies, wind qualifies, <coughs> geothermal qualifies, and biomass qualifies, okay? Um, interesting story with Jerry Brown. He, I'm 42 years old. He was, this is his second time around as, as governor, and he was a, Renewable energy champion his first time. Interestingly, he took over from a, his first time in office. He was the youngest governor in the history of the state. He took over from a Republican movie star, Ronald Reagan. <laughs> and now he is uh, his second time at bat. He is the oldest governor in the history of the state. And he took over from a Republican <laughs> movie star who's Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> so he's on a roll. Um, he's also, interestingly, um, other than a very brief stint by Gray Davis, who was a Democrat in the early 2000s, um, I'm 42 and Jerry Brown is the only Democratic governor in my life. We've had a lot of Republicans, even though it's a very, very blue state. Ronald Reagan and Duke Majin and Wilson and Schwarzenegger. So uh, this is really, I think, a central part of, of Governor Brown's legacy is pushing renewables. So I want to walk you guys through some of, the, some of the projects. We're now at about roughly 22, 23% renewable. So we're going to do a little tour of some of these projects, okay? So this is called the Ivanpah Project. This is the largest <laughs> solar thermal project in the world, okay? It is, there's three units. So what you're looking at there are three 450-foot towers surrounded by 173,000 <laughs> heliostats. So a heliostat is basically a mirror. It's roughly 10 by 15 feet. And it's on an algorithm so that as <coughs> the sun moves across the sky, it hits these mirrors, and they focus all their light to the top of the tower. So this is not energized at this point. Um, this, is, this photo is probably from August or so. Right now, the first unit is energized. The second will be energized in two weeks, and the third unit by the end of December. Okay, so this is basically, yes? Do they have to go out there and wash those mirrors? So they do wash them, yeah. And the soiling is, uh, it's not yet clear, I think, operationally how frequently, but probably once a month, I would guess. Um, so this technology basically is a, is a new technology. It's from an Israeli company called BrightSource. It is, uh, and there's definitely environmental challenges with this. There's a lot of opposition to this project. When it's energized, it is so bright, it's actually the second brightest thing in the world after the sun, okay? So you cannot look at it directly with your eyes. You have to have sunglasses when you're looking at it. It's out in the middle of the desert, middle of nowhere, and, um, there is, you know, there's other challenges. This is, um, so essentially you're replacing natural gas, you know, with uh, the sun's heat. But they do need a gas line, so they actually preheat the boiler at the top. Uh, and so that's controversial, and they use 140 acre feet a year of water. So, uh, so there are, you know, some, some complexities with this. Um, I'm on a siting, one of the things we do is we approve, this happened before I got on the commission, but I'm on a siting case right now, so that all these projects have to come to us for approval. So the, n the next one of these projects, which is about 30% bigger, is coming to us, and I'll be voting on that in the next few months. And that is even bigger. That's a 750-foot tower because what they find is that when the tower is higher, they can bunch the mirrors in closer together because the mirrors don't shade each other, each other so much because the angle is steeper. So um, anyway, so this is the Ivanpah project, and that will be uh, online by the end of the year. Um, this is the world's largest thin film solar PV project. It's 550 megawatts, it's in Riverside County. It's called Desert Sunlight. And this is the difference between thin film and, and crystalline PV. Most of the time when you're looking at a solar panel, most of the time you're looking at crystalline PV. Okay, the difference with thin film is that it's a lower efficiency. You basically are taking that photovoltaic material and they're spraying it on in a very, very thin la layer, but it's lower efficiency. And so um, 
they're installing this at a rate of a megawatt a day. And this is fixed tilt, so they're putting it in the ground and it's just uh, staying there um, and not tracking. When the efficiency, because tracking systems, when you, when you have a tracker, right, it's following the sun as it moves across the course of the sky, you're generating about 25% more power, um, but it's a little bit more costly to install because you have a motor, right? And so there's a calculus when the efficiency is low, the cost to do the tracker doesn't make sense. Right, so the higher the efficiency, it actually does. So now, during the course of this project, the efficiency of the at the manufacturer level of the solar panel got good enough so that going forward, all the projects with this company, which is an American manufacturer called First Solar, are going to be on tracking. So um, this is the world's largest wind project. So this is the Alta Wind Energy Center. It's in Kern County, and anybody in California, if you say the word Kern, Kern County. You think of oil. So California is the third biggest oil producer in the country. But actually, wind has become a huge resource here. So this is the second largest contributor to the tax base in Kern County. It's got um, $40 million a year to the local tax base. And they have actually put in a GE wind turbine manufacturing facility on site that they're using to ship to other parts of the country. And they're expanding and putting another 200 <coughs> megawatts uh, by the end of this year. Um, one of the things that's happened in wind, it used to be they had smaller turbines, like 65 kilowatt turbines, that were on a lattice structure. And what happened is that would be sort of a, a perching opportunity for birds. So birds would actually, right? So, and the RPM was very high. It was like 45 to 50 RPM. So these new towers, it's a solid steel column, it's no perching opportunity, and the RPM is like 12, okay? So these are big, big turbines. Um, they're uh, basically a megawatt and a half uh, turbines. The, there's been some talk in California of doing offshore wind, and those turbines get really big, like seven megawatt turbines. Yeah, and what, what they have, the thing is, the wind resource offshore is really good. Like it's basically, you know, 40% capacity factor. It's, you know, it's like almost twice what it'd be on land. Um, but it's expensive to install. And so one of the, 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 one of the things they're looking at actually is they have a new system. I just saw an R&D presentation on this where they drill a pylon into the seabed and they have like a, <coughs> a massive flotation device that they put at the bottom of the turbine and this thing is basically the tension on it is so great and so it's sort of right there at the ocean surface it's so great that there's no sway so the sway on a you know with this system at sea is the same as when on land so that's uh, been interesting. It's still much more expensive to install them. So we will not see those for a little while. But eventually, I think that will, that will happen, partly because so <coughs> many our population centers are on the coast, right? And so you're close to load as well. OK, so this is the world's largest crystalline solar PV project. This is now being installed. It's going to be 579 megawatts, also in Kern County. It's called the Solar Star Project. It's an American solar manufacturer called SunPower, which is a high efficiency uh, solar cell manufacturer. And this is the world's largest geothermal power plant. So this is called the Geysers. This is uh, 955 megawatts in Napa County. One of the differences between a resource like geothermal and one like wind and solar is that um, geothermal is not intermittent. This is basically going 24 hours a day. And so that's valuable. Um, you know, resources like wind and solar, you, you do depend on when uh, the sun is out and, and, and it's windy. Um, so we do need a mix of these, all these technologies. This is more expensive, and that's one of the challenges is the, in the RPS bidding right now, solar PV is beating everything else because it's so much lower, lower cost. And this is the world's largest solar thermal uh, parabolic trough plant. So this is called the SEGS project. It's uh, 310 megawatts, and interestingly, this is not new. This, this project was put in 26 years ago. I was just, I visited every single one of these facilities I'm showing you, and, and this one I went to maybe two months ago, <laughs> and it is still going strong. There are some uh, broken mirrors. It does, you do see that. It's very, very windy out there. Um, and there's l some limited things you can do, like when it's really windy, they can put the panels in a sort of a stow position, but you do have some breakage. What the way this technology works is the sun basically hits this mirror, and the mirror focuses all the light onto the tube, and you're basically superheating uh, synthetic oil. 
and then that is going to run a steam turbine. And one advantage this technology has that PV does not is that there inherently is some storage in that. In other words, if, if there's an eclipse or <laughs> the sun suddenly stops, uh, it gets covered by a cloud, uh, or even after the sun goes down at night, um, when PV would stop generating, this has about an hour of power you can generate just from the heat that's in the tubes. So that gives you a little bit more shoulder, basically. Uh, but again, this is much more expensive. This is the ther solar thermal technologies I've shown you are roughly twice the cost of, of PV. Okay. So um, on new solar homes, some really exciting developments. In 2006, <coughs> California adopted a really big program called the California Solar Initiative to really get solar PV to scale. And so the idea was uh, let's set up a long-term incentive program where the incentives decline over time. Uh, and part of that program would be just focused on new construction. At that time, in 2006, no new homes were being built with solar. None of these developers wanted it. They didn't understand it. And so what the program did is basically gave them a big incentive. They got a cash incentive uh, per, per project. And they started putting this stuff in. And uh, what they found was that if you put in a new, new solar on a new homes community right next to a new homes community with without solar, the ones with solar actually sold faster. And it is, it is actually cheaper to install it uh, at the beginning. In some cases, in this case, they're using a solar tile that's basically instead of uh, roofing material, okay? So we have about 8,000 new, new solar homes installed and there's about 12,000 more. So generally for all solar PV, <coughs> the warranty life is 25 years. The actual life cycle of the module is longer than that. Um, but the warranty is only 25 years. There's no moving parts, so. Um, all right, so this is kind of what the renewables portfolio <laughs> looks like. And I want to just walk you guys through this. So today, we are right here, basically, the vast majority of the renewables today have come from wind and geothermal, okay? But going forward to 2020, um, this is happening. Solar is actually going to be about half of all the renewables procured under the RPS. And of that, solar PV is the lion's share of that. So I want to unpack that a little bit for you guys because this is actually <coughs> um, very exciting, what's happening with solar costs, and, and I think very, very significant. Um, since 1980, the average cost of a solar panel has gone down 98%. Okay, there's no other energy technology that I'm aware of that's had that level of cost reduction. Um, and the formula has been pretty constant, which is that every time global demand for solar power doubles, the price goes down by about 20%, okay? So cost reduction in solar is driven really by three things, okay? Which is innovation, automation, and scale, okay? And all three of those things are happening. Um, arguably the biggest of those has been scale. And so China has actually played a very important role in this. Uh, my, my view is basically the U.S. has been leading on innovation and to a lesser extent on automation, um, and then China has been leading on scale. So what's happened, particularly in the last five, six years, has been revolutionary. China went from manufacturing 5% of the world's solar panels to manufacturing today 70%, okay? The government there decided this is, you know, they wanted to win on this, and they wanted it, they wanted the jobs there. And so they, if you start a solar factory in China, you get free land, you get free electricity, you get, um, you get basically fast track permitting. Uh, you can build a whole factory there in you know, four or five months, whereas here it would take you a you know, year and a half. Um, and they heavily incentivize it. And uh, that's made a huge difference in getting to scale. At the same time, other parts of the solar energy system have been getting better too. So it used to be you know, you'd have um, an inverter, right? So you, solar makes power in DC, it's gotta go to AC. And that inverter would take 30% of the energy and you lose it in the inversion. And so today, the average loss is uh, only 1.5% and, and getting close to 1% actually now. So uh, it's a lot of improvements there. But this is exciting because there is no other technology that is as low impact as solar PV. You can put this on your roof. It makes no noise, has no, no moving parts. There's no emissions. Uh, and in many cases, for flat roofs, it's not even visible, right? Um, and as costs come down, you know, this scares a lot of utilities because they, 
you know, this is very much moving away from the central station model where a utility generates the power and they sell it and allows people <laughs> to generate their own power. And so it's actually causing a lot of consternation and discussion among utilities about what's the business model of the future. And so part of it has been what we see in California is almost fighting the future <coughs> and, and the choice facing the utilities, I think, is between being an agent of change or a victim of change. This technology is continuing to come down in price. It needs more help. Um, I think the more volume you get, and that was kind of what excited me early on in the solar field, is like what we really need are policies to create that volume to keep the cost coming down. Because at a certain point, you know, it just becomes cheaper than everything else. And that's, uh, I think, a real tipping point. So this is where the co some of the cost reduction is coming from. Um, this shows you the price at the end of 2010 and the price to today, uh, or even yeah, end, of, end of last year, really. And the silicon materials come down, technology advancements, et cetera. And this is the California Solar Initiative, just to give you some sense. So we have about two gigawatts of solar power that uh, are going to be online by the end of this year. And this is actually, this energy does not count even towards our RPS. This is just on rooftops owned by customers. It's actually additive to the RPS. So, um, you know, we're basically doubling in size almost every year, the amount of rooftops. So we have about 200,000 uh, rooftop solar energy systems uh, in the state today. So in general, what has worked so far? Uh, I'd say the biggest thing has been the RPS, the Renewable Portfolio Standard. And after that would be uh, net metering and, and the California Solar Network. Net metering, how many people are familiar with net metering? A couple of you guys, okay, good. So basically the benefit of net metering is you get a credit that's equal to what you'd otherwise pay the utility for power at that time of day. Customers understand this and it's very simple policy and actually becomes itself kind of a sales tool because um, people get it. And no matter, electric rates change all the time, right? But with net metering, whatever the rate <coughs> that the utility's charging, that is the rate you'll get credit for. So it's actually, you know that um, you can essentially zero out your bill. And so that's been incredibly helpful. So that we just raised the net metering cap in California. So we have net metering now through um, uh, July of 2017, so for another four years, okay? And then finally, this California Solar Initiative, which is a $3 billion incentive program. And the way that was structured is the incentive started off high at $2.50 per watt, and it was in 10 steps. And so you'd get to a certain volume target, and then it would drop down to $2.25 a watt, and then $2 a watt. And we're now at the end of that program, okay? <laughs> and the, that's essentially a glide path for the industry. And the reason that was helpful is that when you have a long-term stable program, companies know that the market is going to be there and you get investment into the industry that wouldn't occur otherwise. Because people have to take risks if you're going to try to develop a more efficient inverter or a more efficient solar panel or some new innovation. Um, you may not want to do that if you're not sure the market's going to be there. So what happened is we set up this program. It brought in about $10 billion of new investment into the solar industry. And now you have innovation, like there's a company called Zep Solar. And what they did, they essentially have uh, eliminated the rack when you install solar on a roof. So they make, you just essentially put in this one bolt in the roof and the panels click directly to that, like snap connect. And so you're eliminating probably, you know, 50% of the steel or the aluminum in the, in the, the installation and it installs faster. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so this is Tesla. Uh, this is the largest manufacturing operation in the state of California. They are making 500 cars a week. They're, um, the car they're making has about a 300 mile range. It's made with lithium ion batteries and um, incredibly exciting. I went there about a month ago uh, over 3,000 people uh, working there. They're headed towards making a car that, this, so the car they're making now is for $70,000. Their goal is a $35,000 car um, by 2017 that goes 150 miles. That's where they're going. This is an uh, electric bus by a, a company called Proterra. This goes uh, 30 miles, so two city bus routes, and it can recharge fully in the time it takes a driver to have a bathroom break. So 10 minutes. That's a 440 volt charger on the roof. And this is where the industry is, is headed. So lithium ion batteries are the main driver. And you can see this is from Samsung, which is the largest lithium ion manufacturer in the world. 
about a third of the global market. And this is the chart they gave me of where so their costs are going to basically uh, cut by 75% over a decade. All right, I want to just talk about what's been the impact on rates, okay? Uh, some of the pushback you get on renewables, it raises rates. But with efficiency, I just want to point this out. The red dot represents the average rate uh, per kilowatt hour. Um, so we're in California about 15 cents a kilowatt hour, okay? The rest of the U.S. Um, would be this red dot, uh, maybe, maybe 12 roughly. But our average bill, how much money people are spending every month, is actually lower than the U.S. And that's because we're using less energy. So more expensive rates, it's important to make that distinction because it does make a difference. At the end of the day, what people really care about is how much money they're going to spend. So you can do renewables and keep the bills reasonable. Um, we're doing high-speed rail in California. Um, this is a massive project, $68 billion over the next you know, 15, 20 years. And that will actually be <coughs> entirely powered 100% by renewables. The Navy, too, has nine bases in California, and they're committed to do half of their energy by renewables by, by 2020. And the Secretary of the Navy, uh, Ray Mabus, has been a real champion for this. Um, one concern I have, actually, despite all this good news, clean tech investment is down. And with that, the lowest point has been in the last four years. And part of that is we don't have certainty beyond 2020. And so this is really coming back to the main point. Having the thing that we need to kind of cultivate the renewable industry is long-term stable policy. So the kind of thing I'm working on is to get the next target beyond 33%. I'd like to see a 51% RPS for, for California. All right, I want to tell us a quick uh, tale of two light bulbs here. So one exciting thing, the Energy Commission set a quality standard for new LED lights. And what we said is you got to have a light bulb that basically has the same light quality as an incandescent. And unless you can produce that, you're not allowed to get any rebates in the state. And so the first company to do this uh, just came out with their product. It's, it's, a, it's a company called Cree. They're in North Carolina. And this is a typical screw-in A-lamp light bulb. And it basically has a color rendition of 97. So it's essentially a color rendition for, uh, just to give you guys some sense, it's a 0 to 100 scale. So those terrible, like, yellowish, high-pressure sodium street lights, those would be about a 30. Your CFL bulb, you know, this squiggly would be about a 75. So this is, this is, and the incandescent would be 100. So this is basically in the 95 to 100 range. So, and it lasts for 25 years, um, costs $3 a year rather than $10 a year, and it's dimmable. And so uh, really exciting uh, development. And we have 60% of our lights in the state are still incandescent. So a lot of opportunity to upgrade there. Um, this is one kind of neat thing I want to show you guys. Your house has an energy heartbeat, OK? And so now we have smart meters on all. Uh, every customer in the state has a smart meter, which can, you can get 10-second data. And so I just met with this company last week in Silicon Valley called Bidgley. And they actually can tell with that smart meter data they look at your energy use, what appliance is running. So this is what a clothes dryer <coughs> energy profile looks like. This is what it looks like when you're cooking. This is what your pool pump looks like. And they can basically tell what device is running, and then they know what the baseline is, how efficient that is, versus you know, what they, can, they basically can get an email, a sort of touchless energy audit, say, hey, by, hey, by the way, you know, your freezer is like super inefficient, you could save $500 over a year if you'd upgrade, that kind of thing. So this is just beginning to become, to become possible. Um, I talked a little bit already about the utilities. The utility business model has to change. And they have to basically move away from being just the company that provides power to be, in my view, more pipes and wires and letting you know, clean power get from, in some cases, from customers to other customers. Uh, and I think that's, that's going to be one of the biggest changes. So ultimately, all the decisions on energy um, have to be balancing these three things, cost, environment, and reliability. <coughs> if we push really strong environmental policies, but they have a problem with reliability or they cost too much, you get blowback. And so we, that's the trick is to make it as green as it can be, keeping those other two things um, in balance. And I want to just close with uh, a little story that I find inspiring. So this is uh, the dining hall at New College <coughs> in Oxford University. And when this building was built um, in the 1700s, I believe, they, dis they put in these huge beams uh, on the ceiling. And after about 200 years, they discovered these beams were starting to rot out. There was some beetle that was getting infected. And they were looking, where are we going to get beams this size? And it turned out they asked around. There was a 
actually a college forester. And he said, you know, I've been waiting for someone to ask that because every college forester, they actually planted trees just for this purpose when they built the building. <laughs> so they were thinking 200 years ahead, which is, I think, how I all of us. I, yes, I, do you I know that? Oh, okay, the, 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 the roof was actually built in the 1400s. Oh, good. There we go. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad someone knows it better. <laughs> Oh, that okay. it was actually afterwards that they realized there was going to be a problem. And so the forest was planted in, I think it was, it was under Elizabeth. So it was before 1604. Good. Um, I'm so glad to get a correction so here. Okay. So <laughs> that, I mean, it, it is. It's my aunt loves this story. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Anyway, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, you know, I just want to close with what I think, what human qualities we need to prevail. Okay, and I think um, when you take on the biggest challenges in life, it's actually where you discover the very best parts of human nature, that creativity and collaboration. And the quality that I think we need the most right now is actually uh, relentlessness. And just fixing ourselves to this cause and Never giving up because sometimes it does get really discouraging. I've, I've had some very low moments in my career, and I just have found if you keep at it and keep working together, one of the best things and the most rewarding part for, for me has been the other fantastic people who are you know, committed to this cause of uh, clean energy future. So I want to do everything I can to support you guys. Happy to be here, and thanks for, thanks for having me.